All right. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for, uh, oh gosh, I feel like we haven't done a cockroach hour in a couple of weeks, but uh, I'm excited about this one. We are uh, actually, this was a bit of an odd title, I think, for some people, but um, this represents some new capability that we've introduced in Cockroach um, in our most recent release. Uh, yesterday, we had a pretty major product release. Uh, we release products, oh gosh, twice a year, um, and uh, typically in the spring and fall. And so we made a, a release yesterday, uh, the 21.1 release. And, and one of the major components of this, or one of the major capabilities was really improving our multi-region capabilities, um, building on stuff that was already kind of core of the database and really simplifying that and, and bringing it into the hands of basically every developer who uses Cockroach. So, and today I actually am gonna, we're gonna talk about some of those features. Um, but before we get started, uh, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, there is a QA panel. There is also a chat. Uh, we love when people engage us in chat. Uh, sometimes these things really kind of spiral out. It's, it's great, right? So uh, talk to each other, talk to us. Uh, we have some people that are that are on that can actually answer questions there as well. I'll be paying attention and, and lobbying questions into our guests as well. Um, and then at the end of the webinar, there's a survey. Please do help provide feedback. Um, we take these things pretty seriously. There's a lot of things that we've changed, of course, across the course of doing these things um, over time. And then the recording will be available this afternoon after the event. I know we stream to YouTube Live, um, and then we're, these things are typically up on our YouTube channel uh, relatively soon. So, um, so again, uh, thank you for joining us. I'm going to ask my uh, my guests actually to also come on video if you guys will. Adam, welcome. Andy, welcome. How are you guys? Good. All right. The good, good, good. So uh, I am joined by uh, two of my peers here at Cockroach Labs, uh, Andy Woods and Adam Storm. Andy Woods is our group manager, our group product manager. Andy, what is your role here at um, at Cockroach Labs? What do you what do you what do you oversee? What do you manage? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am working on everything SQL oriented here. So um, me and the team of PMs uh, that I work with are all thinking about um, how do we make things easy for developers? How do we um, expand out SQL capabilities? Um, and then, of course, I've, I worked uh, quite a bit on multi-region as well, which is you know what we'll talk about here today. That's right. And how long have you been at Cockroach Labs now, Andy? You were before almost... me. I mean, you, you're like an OG. Yeah, almost four years. So it's, uh, wow. it's been a huge, uh, huge journey to, to see the company grow and, you know, more and more customers take advantage and, and see how the product has evolved over that time period. So it's, it's been quite rewarding. Yeah, and I think the arc of kind of the development of all our SQL features over the past four years, I think is one of those things that uh, has been interesting to watch. I mean, we, gosh, I mean, we had like core syntax and then it's like, Gosh, your team had to build out ORMs and everything else, right, Andy? I mean, you, you kind of have that as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we think a lot about the developer interfaces, whether or not it's you know using an ORM or a driver or whether or not you want to use SQL directly, um, really making it easy for developers to, to use Cockroach in, in any form or fashion that they'd like to do so. Right, yeah. And I mean, yeah, where you are wire compatible with Postgres, this is kind of core SQL syntax. I think from the very beginning, I, was it, I think Peter Mattis is the one who, one of our founders actually made the decision to be Postgres compatible, right? I think it was way back early, right? So. Yeah, it actually predates me. So uh, it was one of uh -huh. the uh, sort of early great decisions the company made. You know, you, you, you hope to make good decisions with the information you have available to you. And, and you know, I think we've been lucky that most of the, most of the time we have made good decisions there, but uh, I think that was one that uh, has really been, been successful for Cockroach. And, you know, at the time it was kind of, you know, there's a big wave of NoSQL databases out there. And so it was, you know, it was a bold choice to, to choose SQL and choose Postgres compatibility and, and go that direction. And of course, we've, we've seen the market move that direction um, since then. But uh, but yeah, I think that's one of the, the great foundational choices. I, it's just, it's, I, I think it is the best choice we could have made, honestly. Like if I think about, hey, I'm going to teach people to, hey, you got to learn a new language. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, you know, I was surprised actually that they don't even teach SQL in college anymore. It's like an elective, I guess. I, I don't know, man. When I was in school, I'm undergrad. <laughs> God, I remember that course. So anyway, um, but we'll come back to you, Andy. We, we, we're we're going to have a long conversation about a lot of the features you manage. But I'm also joined by Adam Storm. Adam, what is your role here at Cockroach? Yeah, so hey, Jim, thanks for welcoming me. I'm uh, I'm a director of engineering. I run a virtual team and a virtual team um, at Cockroach Labs is really like an interdisciplinary team that spans a broad swath of our database engine. Um, and that 
uh, virtual team is focused on improving the lives of our customers that are deploying multi-region applications. That's awesome. And so that that capability and that 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 core set of features spans a couple of different things, right, Adam? I mean, you 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 kind of had your tendrils into a, a fair a, across all of engineering, right? I mean, this spans down to the storage layer all the way up to Andy and the SQL layer, right? Yeah, as we're going to talk a little bit about later today, um, it really spans like the SQL interfaces because we changed a bunch of SQL syntax to make this happen. Uh, what we call the KV layer, or as people who aren't as familiar with our product can think of as like the transaction management layer um, because we made changes to the way we do transaction management. Um, We made some changes inside of our SQL optimizer. So really it's like the full area of our stack. Yeah, it's a full stack. And Adam, I was, uh, I I was overjoyed when you joined our team. I mean, you've been building databases for how long? Like you, you of all people on this call are probably the most have the most depth. How long have you been working in, in like on a database? Uh, so I, I, I'm cautious to even say how long, but uh, for <laughs> All a right, long you don't time, have to tell me exact, I guess. <laughs> I don't right? want to date myself, but for uh, more than one decade, I've been working in database technologies. Um, okay. I well, joined, I like this. Yeah. I joined a major database vendor right out of uh, school, um, which was quite lucky because Uh, When I went to university, I kind of thought that databases were like old stodgy technology and like nothing really was going to change in there. Um, And that was a long time ago. And databases, I don't think have ever been as hot as they are right now. Well, maybe like in the 70s. Um, But uh, yeah, it's been an exciting career. I've been worked on all areas of database technology right down from um, how they how to make them self manage themselves better to transaction management to the way we store data on disk. Uh, I even took a crack at building a database from scratch uh, right before I moved over to Cockroach Labs. Yeah, da- building. I, I wish it was easy to build a database because I think a lot of people would have done that, right? Like, but it's just simply not, right? Like, I, this is not. It's funny. We should have like eighty database companies, but we probably do. We should probably get 800. If it was easy to build a database, everybody would do it. You would just build it into your application, right? But I think that's the, I always find it to be the, you know, uh, it's the corner cases in a database that kill you. And and how do you kind of weed those out? And so um, it's interesting. It's, sorry, everybody. The garbage trucks are going by outside. I hope there's no um, background noise here, but try to keep, I, I have a directional mic, but um, yeah, Adam, I was I was extremely excited when when you joined the team. Honestly, bringing that much experience into this world, but then you know, rounding that out with distributed systems is this is a wholly other world of database to build out now, which I think is um, to me, I think the funnest part about this. You know, I've been in data for over over a decade as well. I like this. I like the over a decade thing. I'm going to start using that. How long have you been doing product marketing, Jim? Over a decade, um, more than ten. Actually, it might be more than to now. I don't know. Sorry. I'll age myself. I don't care. So, all right. So guys, I wanted to this today, we, you know, you, you two were both instrumental in building out some of the core features that, that we just, you know, really the main set of features that we are talking about yesterday as we released, uh, you know, 21.1 of, of cockroach. So I'm going to go, man, my little mouse trigger is really, really super, super like like tense today or something. Um, so this is, you know, people ask us, is this like a beginner, intermediate, advanced session? This is kind of more of a little bit of an intermediate session, y'all. This is, uh, you know, some of the topics here are not stuff that everybody is readily like aware of, right? Like I think when you start thinking about the physical nature of data in a distributed system, I think this is the stuff that, you know, I've enjoyed talking about a lot uh, as we've like the cap theorem webinars and, and cockroach hours we've done. We've been talking a fair amount about this because I think that's a, a key concept in distributed systems to really think about. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, something we used to call topology patterns, which basically, I don't know, Andy, you don't ever want to say the word topology pattern again if, you're, if, if it was Andy talking. Um, but it's actually pretty important because I think there's goals that we have with our data uh, and a database that that back up our applications. And I, I, I think about it as, as, as survivability goals or latency goals and, and what are those kind of patterns we, 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 we see our customers use with a distributed database, which I think is helpful for anybody just in distributed systems. And then we'll talk about, you know, the multi-region and stuff, some of the stuff. And Andy's going to give us a demo today, which is, which is great. So um, I, I love a, a little bit of a hands-on thing. So I'm going to stop sharing so people can actually see us as opposed to the thing. And I want to get my session notes up, guys. So um, we have a good conversation. So I don't know, let's just start, you know, um, 
you know, let's just start at the beginning. You know, I, I mentioned kind of the physical nature of data. You know, I think when people typically deploy a database, right, Adam, they think about the logical database model, right? Like, here's my tables, here's my referential integrity. I'm going to normalize data, you know, like, and I think that's what I grew up thinking about. But the physical nature of data is something that's kind of new, right? And, that, and I think that is something that I think people have a hard time grasping because if you think about distributed systems, where data lives is actually pretty important. So what are kind of the, the major problems that, you know, these capabilities that we're about to talk to solve for people? Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly true what you're saying that from an application development perspective, people don't really think about where their data sits. And that's really been like the domain of database administrators for the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years. Um, but principally what people are trying to solve with multi-region, there's like a few aspects. The first is um, high availability and ensuring that their database doesn't go down. I don't know how, Jim, how far back in history you want to go, but um, we can talk about how like in the 60s and 70s and um, 80s when databases were first created, like they were principally designed to run on a single large machine. And that was, right. uh, they were designed that way because the strategy there then was you buy the biggest machine that you can afford and machines were super, super reliable in general. Um, and so you put your database on the biggest machine you can afford and um, that would allow you to scale to the largest number of transactions per second. Um, and that model worked well for a while, um, but people at some point um, realized that the price of hardware was going down, um, but going down in the distributed or the commodity, you can call it market, um, where hardware was cheaper, but less reliable. Um, and then the issue then became how you could scale from one big machine to multiple smaller machines to really save money, but also to allow you to be able to start surviving failures. When you have a database that's on one machine, if that machine goes down, your database is not available. Um, so then there were- And a bunch your app of is not, and your, and your app is not available. I mean, exactly. it's just like, you're done. You're dead in the water, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, once computers started to be able to talk to each other and, and, you know, the internet proliferated, you could start spreading out these machines further and further apart. Um, and there were models to do that, like using change data capture as a popular model. Um, but change data capture had limitations too. Like you're, for those of you who aren't familiar with change data capture, the broadest principle is transactions are executed um, on site A, and then they're transmitted across a wire to site B at where they're replayed. Yeah. Um, so the problem with change data capture is that principally speaking, you can only have uh, transactions occurring on one side or the other. Um, and so customers uh, realized that they'd have this A site and then there was a B site that was just sitting there replaying transactions and waiting for a failure to occur. So there's lots of customers who can incur that kind of hardware overhead, but even the customers that can, they're thinking like, why are we paying for twice as much hardware? We can, and we're not really getting any use out of that other hardware until a failure occurs. Um, so then customers started trying to run change data capture where you have um, transactions flowing into machines on both sides. Um, and the problem right. obviously there is that um, you could have a transaction that is touching a certain piece of data on the A side, and then another transaction at the same time that's touching the same data on the B side, and then when those transactions flow across the wire, then you have to somehow resolve the conflict there. Um, and you lose consistency really in doing that because you have to have some mechanism to either uh, abort a committed transaction or um, somehow resolve them so that this gets worked out. Um, so change data capture wasn't really like a mechanism to solve this problem. And yeah, I can and, go on. And, and it's, no, no, please, Adam. Actually, I want to go back to something you talked about. And so if I think about it, like the consistency issue was a big deal, right? So setting up, you know, active, passive, or even active and kind of the secondary active, like in using CDC, it just, I, I, I find the pattern to be flawed. I think we did this because that's what we had. But that was the state of the art, right? And I think that's what happened. And I want to go all the way back to your first, I mean, I, God, man, I remember when I was a consultant, you would, we joked about it was like, well, we had to go uh, do our license costs with Larry and whatever budget we had left over, that was the size of the machine we got. You know what I mean? It wasn't even like do the machine first and then get the database. No, it was like you had a budget and that was it, right? And, and I think, you know, doing that twice for an active passive system, the costs go crazy, the management of these things, like 
the, the pure operational nightmare of managing two massive systems, even in a single data center, difficult, right? Like do it in two, okay, I'm SSHing into one or the other. Like it's just a, it's a, I, I think those complexities, but it's also this, yeah, it's the, it's the consistency of data and like, great, I have this big secondary system and it's, I'm just wasting, I'm basically wasting compute cycles because it's just yeah. sitting there waiting, right? And so, um, but I think that was one problem, right? It was like the, it was the, it was the, the, I think multi-region solves this, 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 the failover, right? The DR, right? Like the, the disaster recovery things, right? Um, multi-region also helps us address latency issues, right? Yeah. So I, I didn't really get to the part where multi-region starts, uh, solves the HA problem, but the, the bottom line was technology advanced. People want to move their computers further and further apart so that um, if one right. site goes down, you can survive that failure. Um, so that's the availability side. But as you mentioned, there's also the latency side. Um, more and more companies now are having a global presence with customers in various geographical regions. Um, and the idea behind multi-region is in part that you can put the data where your users are. And then when the users need to access the data, they don't need to incur, incur like a cross ocean hop to see the data that they're interested in. Like you can imagine um, a big multinational corporation setting up a single database or even like a multiple databases in North America, all of their European and Asian customers ha now have to incur this right. like 100 plus millisecond hop to get their data, which is not right. the best user experience. Right, or you're dealing with the consistency issue of, you know, yeah, you're using CDC to move data, but then, okay, what happens when two records get hit in two separate regions, right? And so I, I think the, again, I think the world has come to a different place. I. You know, you guys, I like to think about what, you know, the, you know, what the Google team has done over the last 15 years, 20 years. And, you know, they, they didn't say, hey, let's just use tech. Let's, you know, let's move and improve, right? Let's not lift and shift. Let's actually re-architect and rebuild. And I think that, that is, I think the, that's the genius of Google. And, and when they think about scale and global and, and truly like online, you know, HA, like it, it's just, it's tremendous, right? And they kind of built from scratch. And, you know, how, did you read the Spanner white paper when it came out, Adam, or did, was this kind of something that came to you a little bit later? No, we, we were reading it where I was working right when it came out. And also, yeah. I mean, we were mindful when Cockroach Labs came out of stealth mode that they were building something that was going to bring this to the masses in the sense that you could put it in your own data center. Uh, so we were aware of everything that was going on in the industry at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. It's like, you know, if you look at what, you know, just if people aren't familiar, like Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gemawat, and there's a lot of like pretty distinguished scholar engineers at, uh, at, at Google, you know, big table, I would think is kind of the beginning of the NoSQL era. Uh, I think that spanner is the beginning of what I think is a wholly different engine that's distributed SQL. Um, I think somebody was actually asking in the chat, what's the benefit of putting a SQL engine over NoSQL database? This is actually, what we're talking about is not a NoSQL database. A NoSQL database is actually fairly different than this. This is, you know, this is at the core, we're a KV store, right? That's what we were talking about, Adam, early. Um, but then it's distributed execution on top of that, that is built for transactions. If people are familiar with the CAP theorem, we're definitely a kind of a, a CP database. So um, consistency and partition tolerant, partition tolerant, God, I can't say that sometimes. Whereas like a NoSQL database is definitely more kind of an AP type approach to a database in terms of a distributed system. So I think that's the, I think that's the big difference. This is definitely kind of a relational workload transaction based um, database. So, so, um, you know, so we, we, we built this stuff. I think we were inspired a lot. I think, you know, Cockroach, uh, you know, Peter Spencer and Ben all coming out of Google kind of inspired heavily by the, uh, by the Spanner white paper, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of core baseline capabilities in Cockroach that have been there for really quite some time, right? I mean, we've been doing this for a while, right, Adam? Yeah, we have. And uh, if you look actually at our first architectural uh, document, like from 2015, um, in the first paragraph, the founders laid out their objectives to create a database that had uh, geographically consistent transactions, like I don't know, back in 2015, that, that was a pretty ambitious goal. Um, and I think it's even ambitious today. Like we're still pushing the limits of what's possible in uh, geographically partitioned transactions. Um, and um, we're pushing the envelope even further in the 21.1 release, which came out mm -hmm. this week. 
Yeah, and I think one of the things here is you, you, to accomplish this sort of thing, you can't like apply this to an existing architecture. I, I think that's a that's a non-starter. You kind of have to start from the ground up and re-architect to basically be partition tolerant and geo-distributed, right? Like I think that's the, um, but it's been fairly complex, I think, you know, I don't know, Andy, are you familiar with kind of the more of the patterns that people use these capabilities for? Like, what are they trying to accomplish with this sort of thing? You know, like fast reads in one region, but survivability for other tables, because we can actually do this at the table level. And there's a lots of different like reasons why people use this, correct? Yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, yeah. I think we talk about this a lot, but people want the high availability, right, that comes from this, and they want the uh, low latency, right? And and it depends on uh, which table, which type of latency they care about. Do they care about read latency, write latency? Um, and, and how do these things like play out when you're actually building an application, right? And so um, one of the things that's great about Cockroach is that uh, because we, we um, you know, can use these kind of modern machines, we can be deployed in multiple regions, um, you can operate sort of one logical database across multiple regions here in the process. But of course, um, mm -hmm. if you do that, you're, you're going to be spreading across all those regions, right? And so um, we offer a grid default experience for how this works. But one of the things we've really been thinking a lot about in this release is um, how do we let you declare to us, you know, what your survival goals are, what you want to tolerate here, and what your latency needs are, and let us take care of the complexity involved in that um, and really make that um, much, much easier for you to communicate to the database, right? And so, you know, it, it sort of builds on this tradition of SQL, right? Where SQL is this declarative language, right? You don't tell the optimizer exactly how to, um, you know, plan a query or go about this, right? You trust the optimizer to have, um, you know, transformations and rules and normalizations and these kinds of things to, to pick the best pattern for you, right? And it's the, it's the same thing here where um, many databases kind of force you to imperatively declare exactly how you want these things to work. And that, that can be, you know, uh, tedious. It, it can be time consuming. Um, and, and really what we were thinking about is how do we make this experience more declarative like SQL, like people are used to, to use it with them. Right. And I think that's, you know, it's a key thing because I don't think everybody thinks about the physical nature of data. It comes back to what we were talking about, Adam. Like, I don't think people in distributed systems, I think this is one of those core things that if you start to think about distributed, it just means basically you, you're adding the physical nature of data to your, the physical nature of something to whatever you're doing. Um, and, it, and it is in those corners where the complexity comes. Yeah, there's complexity around networking and security and storage and all these things. But like, like the the intellectual challenge I think that people have getting into distributed systems is is definitely around, in, in, you know, encompassing this this physical nature of data. And I think you know there's lots of different goals on on a table by table basis too, right? Andy, I mean, like you may want fast reads in every region, but I want you know, I want availability for another table. And I think it's it, it comes down to not just at the database level, but at the table level as why as well, right? Do you, do you think developers think like that yet, Andy? Or is this kind of like one of these emerging things? Yeah, actually, I, I think that was the challenge is that, um, you know, when we interviewed developers and talked about them, they could say like immediately, like, oh, I have this, you know, rides table. Like they knew immediately where they needed to have fast read and write access or fast read access right. depending upon the table. They couldn't figure out how to communicate and set up a database <laughs> to meet those needs, right? Like, so, so that was, that was actually, you know, one of the things that, that we were really excited to hear about is that developers did know these things. They did think about these things. They just didn't right. have a way to express them to us um, that was simple for them to, to go. And so that, that's kind of the, that was the sort of key insight that led us down where we're at now today was that um, right. developers did know what they needed to have happen from a from a latency perspective and from a survival perspective and they just needed a way to to tell that to us so we could take care of it for them well that's right and i think that it's a great jumping point into what did we build right andy because i think like it is in those conversations is where we actually do a whole lot of discovery of people using these systems and and i think i think you're right i think people once they get this then they actually can really think about I want it, it's it's about read writes and it's about latency or it's about you know a table and its survival goals or even further I think it's really interesting and you know a lot of our you know more I think European people think a lot more about data sovereignty I think here in the states we're a little loose you know um, but where where data lives based on like uh, data sovereignty laws and regulations and you know these sort of things I think this is an emerging group of requirements that. I don't think we can avoid them for much longer. I, I you know, th these these laws have teeth, and it's going to be interesting over the next couple of years how 
these type of capabilities. I think people look to us as like helping them with this sort of stuff. And I think there's a lot of stuff here too. And it, it comes back to that physical nature. So I, and I think we found all, a lot of that in our interview process, Andy, going through this. So, so what did we do in this release? Like what was the, what's the big stuff, Andy? I mean, you, Absolutely. you design this stuff and I, well, you and a group of people, right. But I think it's phenomenal. So what did, what did we do? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we're going to talk about uh, three levels of things, stuff at the cluster level, stuff at the database level, and stuff at the table level. So at the cluster level, um, we now let you use, um, uh, and we actually have always had this, we let people declare where the nodes are located with a thing called locality flags. And so this can be, um, you know, you're in a, a public cloud like the AWS, the GCP, um, and you can just take these region names from that, like US East 1, et cetera, right? Um, and so we, we had these capabilities before, but we just kind of named it this release of calling these cluster regions and it's the region in which the cluster is deployed. So um, if you had nine nodes, three in each region, um, you know, you could set those at the node startup time. And then we now are aware that your cluster is deployed across three regions. So that was kind of step one of sort of naming something we've had and, and making it into sort of a, an abstraction, right? And like, that's what we're going to talk about today is how we take in a lot of capabilities that existed in Cockroach for a long time, but we abstracted them up a layer to make them a lot easier to consume. So the first new thing we introduced is this concept of database regions. And so the idea here is that a database could be employed in multiple regions and that those regions are pulled from the cluster region, but they don't have to be exactly the same. So if you had seven regions available in the cluster, your database could be deployed in one, in five or in all seven, right? That you could choose which regions a database would operate in. You could also have different databases operating in different regions, right? So right. one database could be in three regions, another database could be in all seven, right? And, and this is a really common pattern we see with people using Cockroach is that they have sort of one logical cluster. Each database might represent a microservice or a different use case, um, and therefore need to be deployed in, in different regions here in the process. That's cool. And go on, Andy. Yeah, just the last thing within the database regions, and I'll pause there for a second, is that um, we also introduced this concept of a primary region. And so a primary region is the first region you add to a database to make it a multi-region database. Um, and, and this concept is important because it's sort of the default uh, region that you would get good read and write latency from. So if you, if you didn't make any other changes other than adding a primary region to a database, you'd sort of be signaling, hey, this is the region that we care the most about for our read and write latency. We'll talk in a second about how this relates to survival goals and table localities and, and how this information together gives us enough information to, um, to determine how we want to place data and control all these kinds of things. But um, it's really as simple as an alter database statement primary region, alter database statement at other regions. Um, and that sort of lets us know that you want to operate in these form and fashion. And it, it sort of lets us know where data could live and, and where access patterns are, are going to need to be thinking about. Yeah. And I think what, what I think is incredible about this stuff, Andy, is that we use basically basic SQL syntax to, to do all these things. Right. And I think that was a, that was a core requirement, make it simple and kind of forth you know, yeah, what is alter table? Well, it's alter database, right? And I think that's kind of one of those cool things. Do you, do you want to jump into the demo? I have a couple questions, Andy, but I think, you know, seeing this stuff is is probably the, the biggest powerful thing, right? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I, I want to cover two other concepts very quickly, um, and then I'll show it in the demo, because I know some people like to hear it, some people like to see it. I think, sure. you know, it'll, it'll build on each other. So the, the last thing to cover at the database level is survival goals. And that's kind of where we got the title of this, of this conversation from, where you actually declare at the database level, do you want to survive a zone failure? Do you want to survive a region failure? Um, and then we apply that to all the tables within, within that database, right? And so this is really powerful because um, it's really oftentimes um, easy and obvious for developers and operators to, to know what they need to tolerate from a survival basis. And then if, if they can just declare that to us via this SQL syntax, um, we can actually take care of all the complexity that, that results from that. The last thing I'll talk about is when we now move at the table level, right? So at the table level, um, different tables can have different what we're calling table localities, right? And so by default, tables are gonna be regional tables. And this, these regional tables are tables that have a good read and write latency from a particular region. Um, so the default to that primary region, like we talked about a few minutes ago, um, and that contrasts with global tables. Global tables are about having good read latency from anywhere in, 
you know, in, in the database region. And so the idea here is that you can kind of think about this as, as data that you'd want to be locating everywhere in the cluster that you're operating, everywhere in the database that you're operating in, right? And so this is, um, you know, this might be a postal codes table or a promo codes table or, or something where it's, it's not changing too frequently, but um, you want to have that really good read latency in the process. And so we did a couple of things that we can talk about after the demo about how we made that happen. Um, but that's sort of like the, the basis is like, do you need regional tables or global tables? And then there's one more enhancement we made to regional tables that are called regional by row tables. And these tables are about um, deciding at a row level which rows need to have fast read and write access from different regions. So instead of a regional table where it's everything in the table having a fast read and write access from a particular region, regional by row tables say, um, split the rows up uh, into partitions and, and let them be fast read and write access from the, the region in which they have an affinity for. And so we'll, we'll, we'll show how that works here in a second. Well, I, I, I gotta tell you, Annie, it's pretty awesome. Like being, I, I wanna see this, right? Because like being able to uh, par partition data at the row level based on a column, columnar data, uh, it just, I don't know. The first time I ever saw it in Cockroach, I was just like, oh my God, that is like the coolest thing I think of it. That, and you just can't kill the thing, which is our name, but um, so I, you wanna just go through a demo or? Yeah, let's go into the demo. All right, uh, can you all, can you all see this? Is this big enough for the screen? Yeah, maybe a little bit bigger, Andy. All right. Maybe the resolution a little bit better. I think some people with these huge monitors, it looks great. You know, I'm still working on my little MacBook screen here. So am I, and also I've been working for over a decade. So my eyes aren't as good as everybody else. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, that's totally looks good, Andy. All right. So um, what I'm doing here is I'm setting up a thing called Cockroach Demo. This is a, um, it's a sort of little toy that we built to kind of showcase um, jumping straight into using Cockroach. And so, you know, when I was talking at the beginning about setting up your nodes, the locality flag, um, I, I've sort of already done that. That's what this command lets us skip that step just to, to get quicker to some of the other capabilities here. And so what you'll see here is that we have, um, we have nine nodes deployed here um, and we kind of set these up with the locality flags. And then we're gonna use a, um, a fake database for a fake company called Mover. It's kind of simulating a, a ride sharing app in order to, to talk about some tables within that and, and how these things might work. And, and Andy, this is included in the Cockroach DB binary, right? So, so anybody can actually go and run this right now if they wanted to, so. Yeah, yeah, you, you can use yeah. demo, um, you know, straight, straight from the process. So if you, if you have, um, you know, if you have this on your, on your Mac, like, or your laptop, like I do, like you can run it straight from this. So it's, it's kind of included yeah. in the process. So um, what we've done is we've sort of made these ephemeral sort of like uh, nine nodes on, my uh, on a cluster, like on my laptop in order to, to showcase this demo and show how things work. Um, we ran this new command here, show regions from cluster. This lets us see the cluster regions that we're deployed in and what's available to us. We have three regions, uh, Europe West, US East, US West, and then we have three separate zones available in each region. Um, so this is sort of like maximally set up to, to do this, but of course, um, you know, these region names could be your own private data center, for example, um, that you could have in the process here, or um, you could operate in any different set of regions, right? It's just, th this is sort of the, the default regions that we have set up here for, for what we're going to show today. So Andy, in a, in a raw, like, install of Cockroach, there's no regions defined, right? You, you have to kind of define regions, and the, the default is kind of, it's all going to work within kind of a single region, right? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you need to set these when you uh, deploy nodes. So if you're doing a self-hosted, this means you actually need to set the locality flags yourself. But if you're using Cockroach Cloud, we actually set these for you automatically. So if, you, right. if you've told us that you want to operate in these three regions, we'll set the nodes up with the locality flags so that you'll see something like this the second you connect into the, into the cluster. That's great. All right, so the first command I'm going to run is this alter database. Um, add this primary region US East. And so what this does is it sort of makes Mover then into this new multi-region database that we talked about. We have to add the primary region first to kind of specify the default um, patterns here. And um, what we can do then is we can actually look at the regions from the database Mover. And so what you'll see here is that um, before we were looking at regions from the cluster, right? And we had three regions available. Now we're looking at regions from the database. So this database right now only has one region. We can see that we have set the primary regions. We have a, a Boolean value here for, for true for the primary region. Um, and this is kind of the first step you would take in order to make a database multi-region. Of course, I'm showing you the path of upgrading from like a single region database into a multi-region database, but you could start with a multi-region database from default, right? So you could start with a create database command just in the interest of sort of jumping straight into showing you some tables right. and 
some patterns. We're, we're skipping that for the, for the demo here. So the uh, next thing that I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go ahead and add um, US West as a region, Europe West as a region to the database. And then we're going to look back at the show regions from database command. And so now if we look, uh, we can see that Mover has um, US East, Europe West, US West. Of course, these are false because they're not the primary region. Um, you could change the primary region at any time, right? So you could run an alter database command and, and change the primary region here in the process. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you started with a lot more access in US East and then over time you're getting a lot more access from Europe West, for example. So this is not something that you're locked into, but it's really sort of as simple as declaratively telling us which regions you want to operate the database within. So, so Andy, when I declare a primary region, what is happening with the data underneath? Like what is, the, what is that actually doing to the data? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So, um, Cockroach by default will want to spread your data across all of the uh, nodes and regions available. It's sort of this availability idea that we want to make sure that you you don't kind of you're not susceptible to losing any particular thing. But when you make a database a um, you know add our primary region to a database, what we're doing here is we're saying um, you know you want to have good read and write access from this primary region, and you want to start here. And so we actually um, we kind of home the data in that primary region. And so this is actually pretty powerful when you're on the upgrade path because um, maybe you're only deploying in US East right now. You have good read and write latency right. in US East. Um, you can declare that as your primary region. And then you can go ahead and add new regions to the database and it won't impact your read and write latency at all, right? Like we won't impact your foreground traffic. It won't um, change the access patterns by simply adding these two extra regions. And then you can start to make some of the, the table locality changes that we'll talk about here in a second, or um, right. maybe your app is now deployed in other regions. You're going to start to get new users in those regions. Um, but we can we can sort of give you this um, path from going from a single region to multi-region without actually impacting your um, your latency or your, your current business. So Andy, does that mean underneath the covers? So those, those of you who have actually seen the architecture talk and some of these other things, I mean, we're basically using RAF to distribute data across multiple different regions, right? We're writing in triplicate. We can, incre we can increase the number of replicas, right? And so the leaseholder for that particular range, anybody who's familiar with the lower layers, we're, we're basically automating where leaseholders get placed so that, you know, the initial entry point to that replica set is going to be located in the, in the, in the region to the east, correct? Is that, is that what's going on underneath? Yeah, that's right. So, so Cockroach's sort of like fundamental architecture around using, you know, um, consensus and replication and leaseholders. Um, we're not, we're not getting rid of or changing any of those things. Instead, we're, we're not requiring you to understand exactly how these things right. work underneath the hood. We're letting you instead tell us what you want to operate with, and we can actually control leaseholder placement, control replica placement for you. And, and I'll show you a, at a couple points along the way about how that works and where those things change. But you're, you're absolutely right. When we're, when we're sort of adding this primary region, that's the first time we're sort of um, we're being involved in our zone configurations. We're, we're giving sort of like implicit commands um, for, for how we want to place replicas and how we want to place leaseholders. Right. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So we actually have multiple tables in this database that's already, already been populated right now. And we haven't done anything other than add database regions. And we can actually see that the tables are now regional by table in the primary region. We could change the primary region, as I talked about earlier. We could change uh, and make these regional by table in a different region, right? So we could set this on a, on a per table basis here. Um, but we don't actually have to change all our tables in order to get sort of good read and write latency from this primary region. Um, Technically, that would be all you would have to do if you wanted to start the process of going multi-region. But we've got a number of cool enhancements that um, optimize for survival goals and optimize for latency goals that we're going to walk through here. Um, because you know, we, we talked to customers and they told us they, they sort of needed these um, enhancements for, for different capabilities. So by default, what we do is we set the survival goal to be a zone survival goal. Um, this means that we can tolerate the loss of any particular zone. Um, and this is important because um, we, want to, we want to give you some um, guidance on how we're going to, to tolerate these kinds of things. Um, but we also want to let you opt into having a higher degree of survival, right? And so um, when we talk about this, we talk about a region survival goal. And of course, you, you do need three regions in order to have a region survival goal. And since we have three regions in the database, we're, we're sort of eligible for that. Um, and it's really as simple as running this author database survive region failure, right? And so once you run that, what's actually happening underneath the hood is um, we're saying, hey, you know, this database has really important data. We need to make sure that we're susceptible, um, that we're not susceptible to losing any particular region. And so what we'll do is we'll actually keep the leaseholder in the primary region now, but we'll keep the majority of replicas outside of the primary region. 
This is because we sort of operate in this quorum or consensus protocol. And so we always have to have the majority of replicas available in order to, to sort of serve reads and writes. And so this survival goal changing to region, um, you, you just have to tell us that's what you want. And we'll actually control replica placement. We'll move replicas. We'll, we'll take care of a lot of things in the background for you in order to achieve this goal that you're, you've articulated to us. Right, and Andy, somebody was asking, you know, where is the data laid out? And it, it comes down to, I think somebody was just asking, you know, where, where is all the data? Is it in the same zone? Is it across all nodes in a zone? It, this is exactly what we're allowing people to do. I mean, this, this, this configuration across the entire database or down to the table level and even the row, right? It's, it's your choice now to actually decide what you want to do. Correct, Andy? Yeah, and that's that's actually what we're going to get into right now when we go to the table level. Is that right now at this part in the demo, we have all the data in the primary region, um, and now we've moved some of the replicas out of the primary region so that we can tolerate the loss of the primary region with this arrival goal. Um, but that's kind of how we're optimizing right now. But to cool. your point, there could be people who want to have good read access in all regions, right? And so need a global table that we'll talk about. Or we could right. need to get into these regional by row tables I referenced at the beginning. So we're going to show you how to do both of those really quickly. Um, and just to prove to everyone that the survival goal changed, we can see that it's now a region survival in here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at this table called the promo codes table. The promo codes table is a table that um, we, we want to have really fast reads on this table because we want to have a good access for anybody anywhere in the world. We use the same promo codes everywhere in our ride sharing app, basically. Um, and so you can kind of think about this as like, we want to have like a copy of this table and all the regions in which we're operating in so we can get fast read access from that. And so um, right now it's a locality regional by table in the primary region, but we actually want to make this a global table. That's what we're calling tables that um, have fast reads everywhere in the database, every region in the database. And so this is again, a, it's a simple author table statement um, and you're just setting locality global. And what we're doing underneath the hood at this point is actually we're doing a couple of things. So the first thing is that um, Cockroach has always had voting replicas in the past. That's often what we call replicas. Um, and what we're actually doing now is we're adding non-voting replicas in. So we're putting non-voting replicas in every region in the database, um, which are a, a copy of this data, um, but don't increase the, um, the write amplification in the process of making these non-voting replicas. And the second thing we're doing is we actually have modified our transaction model. So we've, we've changed our transaction model here um, in order to um, optimize for fast read access. And so there's a, there's a lot of sort of complication about how this works. And we have a couple of good pieces of documentation that, that dive into the architecture and go through the details. But the, the sort of mental model to think about here is that you can get consistent, fast, um, low latency reads from any region in the database from global tables. So Andy, really quickly, just to just to kind of confirm that fact, and this is kind of I, I'm my own head getting around this as well. By the way, first of all, our documentation does a great job of explaining these things. I I talk about our docs on every single time I'm on a any session talking about cockroach because I think our docs team does a great job, phenomenal job describing these things. But but coming back to non-voting replicas, it's kind of a new term for for me at least, right? And and if you think in the context of Raft, right? In Raft, if I have three replicas of data, basically. They're, they're the three voting replicas. What you're saying is we then create even more yes. um, and just distribute them and they just don't participate in the RAF protocol. Is that what, is that what you're saying? Yes, that's exactly right. So um, we actually keep uh, the voting replicas for global tables in the primary region and we have the non-voting replicas in every other region. So you know, if you, cool. if you were expanded into you know, seven regions or 10 regions, we'd actually put a non-voting replica in each one of those regions so that anywhere that you wanted to access this data, it would be super fast on, on the read path. And so what you're suffering though, Andy, is you, you may be suffering from consistency of that particular read. Is that correct? Like, cause it's, or, I mean, is it synced is, is, at the no, same no, as the that's, that's actually or? That's actually not true. It's that it's completely consistent. So we, we're never gonna introduce awesome. any kind of database errors or any kind of problems in this process. The, the thing you do pay for is that writes to this global table will take a little bit longer than our uh, writes right. to other tables. And, and so this is sort of where you start to talk about, you know, CAP theorem or you get to involve in these kinds of things where there's trade-offs that you have to make. And that's why choosing the right table locality pattern is, is kind of the one um, real developer-oriented path that you'll need to think about here and, and choose the right one with care. Um, because this wouldn't be a good pattern for something that was going to be written to a lot and changed a lot because we sort of, we introduce a delay on those rights in order to not have contention on the read path so that we can get these fast, accurate, um, consistent reads. Right. And it comes down to the, 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 basically the requirements of this particular set of data, right? Like mm -hmm. I want promotional codes everywhere. 
and fast access. I, I'm not gonna, this is a slow moving table. I'm not gonna make modifications to this. So exactly. if it takes a little bit longer, I'm fine, right? Like, and I think thinking through table by table, what your goals are, I think is the, that, that's the lesson I see here. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, we'll, we'll contrast that right now. We're gonna look at this table called the rides table. And so um, the way you think about this rides table is um, you need fast read and write access on the rides table for the region in which the ride is occurring. So if a ride is occurring in US East, you wanna have fast read and write access on that ride That's in right. US East, but you don't necessarily need to have fast read and write access on this table from say like APAC or, or a different region, right? And so um, this becomes a table that is a really good candidate for a regional by row table. And so regional by row tables, again, they sort of partition the table up. They say, um, put the rows that correspond to a particular region in that region uh, and make sure that, that then there's good fast read and write access on that particular region. And so um, the, the way we actually do this now is also with a declarative syntax here where um, we do this simple alter table statement um, and we've set this locality regional by row. And so then if we, if we actually go back now and look at all of the tables that we have in this database, we can see that we've made the promo codes table a global table. We made the rides table a regional by row, but the other tables are, are remain as regional tables because maybe we don't necessarily need to change them or um, maybe they, we need to consider which pattern is the right one for them. And so what's great about this is that if we, if we know the regions that your database operates in, we know your survival goals and you've told us the type of latency that you want us to receive from a table, that's everything we need to know in order to control leaseholder placement, replica placement, transaction model. Um, and we can actually give you these outcomes that you okay. want to receive um, without you having to get into the details of replicas, leaseholders, quorums, um, any of these kinds of other additional pieces of knowledge. Well, I think that's, I'm, I'm sorry, Andy, but that's like phenomenal. Like from a design point of view, actually, you guys thinking through this, you guys, it blows my mind. Like A, mind blown step number one, it comes down to like four SQL statements. I think what's other also cool, you're doing this in production right now. Like you're doing this in a live database, correct? And so how long does it take for all this to happen, right? Because it seems like a lot of data movement, right? Like, so I have like, you know, thousands of rows or millions of rows. Is the database down for some sort of time? Is it in kind of a halfway state while this is going on? Like, how do we mitigate that? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, in, in Cockroach, we, we provide online uh, schema changes. And so we, we actually don't require you to take the database down to make these kinds of changes. Now, awesome. you know, there is work involved in making these changes, right? We do have to move replicas to comply with right. the goals. And, you know, that can take a while depending upon the, the size of data and, and things along this. Um, but you don't have to be down during that time period while it's happening, right? You can continue to serve traffic. You continue to, to provide a good experience to your customers. Um, and then you'll be able to write an even better experience once we've completed this process, right? So, um, so there's, there's really no need for any kind of downtime. And, and that's part of the reason why we think about this as sort of like future-proofing your database is that you can, you can sort of start in a single region and then you can go to a multi-region, uh, you know, via the steps we've shown here um, and not have to, you know, have costly downtime or, you know, make a lot of changes to your application. Um, we didn't get into it today about how the, the regional by row tables know which region to put things into. There's, there's good documentation around this, but I think the salient point is that you don't actually have to change your application at all in order right. to make your database a multi-region database. Right. You're just basically doing a little bit of DML and the whole thing's actually optimized for what you want to do, right? So I think, Adam, this, this is why this is a kind of cross-functional thing, right? I mean, this, you can't just do this in the SQL syntax. This is why... I mean, the execution layer, we had to make changes as well to actually allow for this, right? I mean, it, the complexities around doing this online have, have had to be just kind of incredible. Yeah, so one of the things that Andy didn't really talk that much about is in these regional by row tables, when we're partitioning the tables, there's a whole bunch of work we did right down deep in the query optimizer and execution layer to ensure that when you're querying data from a given region, that if that query is satisfiable in that region, that we don't go off into the other regions to look for the data. Um, and that can take a query that's, um, that would have otherwise been global, like hundreds of milliseconds down to one that's like a few milliseconds to execute. So like a couple of orders of magnitude uh, improvement just by, and I say just, I mean, it was a lot of work, but uh, by, you by just simplified the, like a nightmare down to a simple statement, you know, like, yeah. thanks. Our, Adam, right? our poor optimizer developers are probably <laughs> cringing while I say the just, but um, 
the the work that we incurred on our side um, was really to make the lives of our customers that much easier and not have to uh, determine how to write their queries and point them at given regions. Let the system just do all of that for them. Yeah, and I think it comes back to an earlier point too, Adam. I mean, the, the software engineering that's gone into this is truly remarkable. I mean, we would be remiss without thanking the team of like, I mean, there's some really... I mean, from the design, Andy, from the SQL syntax and how we did that all the way down to this execution, it's just, it's a phenomenal set of work that, that, that was just undertaken by this team. And I think it's, these are not simple things to do. And, and this is why, let the database deal with this stuff. Stop doing this in your application because what can go wrong will. Um, and I always think of, you know, abstract these complexities to the layer where it makes sense. And to me, that's the database, you guys. Like I, why, why would you ever try to do this in, at the applica- in, the, in, your, in your logic? It, you're, it's, it, it, do it here. So You'd only do it um, there if you didn't have an option to do it elsewhere, right? And so that's, right. That, that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here, right? Is that you, you don't that's need right. to sort of salt or hash or pass this information down from your application down into the database. You don't need to modify your queries to make sure that they you know, checked in the local region, right? You don't have to do any of that, right? We just kind of take care of that for you, right? And, and I think that's, yeah. that's one of the really powerful things about this is, is not forcing you to make a bunch of changes to your application in order to meet your, your needs of your customers as you're expanding regions. Yeah, I just had a kind of moment in time for myself, Andy. The very first time I found BEA Tuxedo. So Tuxedo was the precursor to WebLogic and it was like the whole SOA thing. And man, the first time my team found that, we were just like, oh my God, this is like, we were building all that, right? Like we were, we were building it in the application logic and it was just like, oh my God. It was like, okay, rip all, our scope went from like, you know, nine months to like two. Everybody was happy. We delivered way on time. Like I loved Tuxedo back in the day, but but it's kind of one of those things. Once you see it, you're like, oh my God, why would I ever do that anywhere else? So, so yeah. I'll leave this open to the two of you. I'm sorry, go on. No, I was just gonna, I was gonna build on that and just say one more thing on that, Jim, which is that uh, yeah, it's not just like going from single region to multi-region, but your business might continue to scale, right? You might need to open up a new That's set right. of ride sharing options in a new region, right? And so um, all right. you need to do is alter the database and add that new region and it'll cascade all the way throughout um, and we'll update the tables we'll do all this work for you behind the scenes so again it's it's not just about today but it's also about the future as your business scales that um, we can make this just trivially simply to, to expand into new regions so that's the future of what our customers want to do as they get you know successful with their applications what's the future for this stuff you guys where, where do you see this going i don't i don't know who wants to answer that but yeah i mean i, I Go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. <laughs> um, you know, I think that there's always problems that we're going to be trying to solve on the multi-region side. Um, we're always trying to improve the latency um, and improve uh, transactional performance in multi-region settings. And we have thoughts on how to improve that further. Um, there's also work I think we can do to help simplify the process around being declarative around uh, data domiciling. Uh, specifically around uh, government regulations that are emerging yeah. in this space. Um, and it's not only on, on our end, um, because this is always going to be a moving target. Like these regulations are changing all the time. And we're always trying to improve the way the system operates for customers that are trying to meet their regulatory requirements. Yeah, that, I think that's the area that I'm I'm acutely interested in as well, Adam. I, you and I have had some conversations about that. It's 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 interesting to see the data privacy laws kind of proliferate across the entire planet. And why are we doing this at the application layer? Again, like it's, a, you know, if those, if the parts of those requirements about data, let the data do this sort of thing. It seems, it's just difficult to do, honestly. And, and I think that's, I think the other area that I'm going to, you know, auto optimizing and, and looking at the CBO, the cost-based optimizer and how this actually has impacts there. I, there's some really interesting things. And, you know, when I look at it, I, you know, I, I think about the ultimate vision of, of cockroach and making data easy, right? And seeing this kind of the 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 level at which and the focus that we have on kind of the serverless version of cockroach, where yeah, whether there's endpoints across the planet, it's a cluster, people spin up databases, and it's consumption based. And I, I I simplify the database to a SQL API in the cloud. Like there's just some REST interface that I'm coding against. I mean that. Well, if we're gonna do that, we've got to make these things really simple to do. Right. And I think and I think this is kind of the some of those steps that, that that we're taking to really make these things truly global, truly planet type scale. Right. And I think this is the stuff that differentiates cockroach from some of those other things that are out there, because it's you kind of you can't just you can't move and improve. This is re-architect and rebuild. And 
I think if you have control of the entire stack, right, Adam, and what you're doing, like your, your role, like being kind of vertical across all the different things we're building is part and parcel of why this, these things kind of, it's, you kind of have to rethink how these things work underneath. So um, guys, I, thank you for, for doing this today. Um, I, and congratulations on the, on, on getting everything over the line um, yesterday. Right. And not just to YouTube, but I think to the entire team, um, you know, uh, any, any parting words before we take off, I'm gonna do one last thing, but Andy, yeah, you're I, always, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's well said, Jim, is that, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of people to thank within Cockroach who, who contributed to this and built upon this. Yeah. And, um, you know, in particular, I think, um, one of the things that I would encourage everyone here on, cause I, I know there's some questions we didn't get a chance to dive into is that, um, you know, really check out the documentation. We now have, um, architecture docs that describe how this works. We have, uh, tutorials and guides that show you how to, um, go through these patterns. We show you how to pick the right pattern for you. Right. Um, and, you know, it, it sort of makes this real. And of course, you know, there's nothing better than getting your hands on it, right? So trying this out in, in a Cockroach Cloud or, or trying it out in demo. Um, and, and we definitely encourage everyone to, to give it a run and, and to let us know what you find and, uh, and share your feedback with us. But, uh, That's but yeah, right. So. And Andy, I think a lot of the, some of the questions we didn't get to were very explicit kind of usage of this. And I think that's exactly right. The docs will help you like, you know, how do I put data in one region, but protect privacy so that nobody else, like, and there's a lot of things and there's a lot of things we did in Cockroach to make sure that those type of things are, are withheld, right? Like distributed backup and restore, distributed CDC. Like you, when you start thinking about these things, it, it hits lots of different layers of the stack. So the, the, the questions, they're, 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 you know, they're, we're making those things as simple as possible. So um, thank you guys for doing this today. Um, a lot, seriously. I, that was probably one of the more fun sessions. I like, I like hands-on. Thank you, Andy, for doing the demo. Um, it's great stuff. And Adam, as always, a uh, little bit of history on these things, I think is just awesome. So I, I, I love the history side of things too. So yeah. So, um, but if anybody listening, if you want to go out and try these things right now, um, you know, you can, you can, you can use our product, uh, you know, cockroach cloud is really, uh, an easy way to start looking at these things and start playing with it. You know, like Andy said, you know, cockroach demo, which comes with our binary, you can start to at least do it, you know, and start playing with the commands, if you will. Um, you know, in, in a, in a, in a, on your MacBook if you wanted to, or whatever you want to run it on. So maybe not on a raspberry. Can you do this on a raspberry Pi? I guess you could, right? Like we have done enough some powers of cockroach on a raspberry Pi, but, uh, yeah. But yeah. maybe we'd need to. I, didn't we have a demo where you actually like where people were like hammering a pie and killing it, and then like you know the database survived. Right. Anyway, all right. Um, well, listen, you guys. Thank you again. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. Again, the recording will be up and available. If you want to go out and use Cockroach today, um, you know, go to our cockroachlabs.com and you know get Cockroach. You can go spin up a Cockroach Cloud instance. You can actually use Cockroach Cloud free, which. Doesn't deliver all these great capabilities yet, uh, but we're pushing in that direction. Um, but again,